Good evening, everybody. So great uh, to see so many of you here for this uh, wonderful uh, event. As the head of the philosophy department, it uh, is uh, my honor and my pleasure to introduce uh, this valedictory lecture by Professor M.M. M. McCabe. Now, personally, the first time uh, I heard about uh, M.M. was back in the mid-90s. Uh, I had just uh, arrived uh, straight uh, from the so-called uh, continent <laughs> to, to Aberdeen, uh, Scotland, uh, long way. And uh, I didn't really know anything about uh, the British scene, really. And a young colleague of mine, uh, Osford, uh, uh, Osbridge educated, uh, took upon himself uh, to explain to me who were the significant people uh, south uh, of the Scottish board. <laughs> and the very first thing uh, he said was, have you come across a philosopher called M.M. Uh, M. McCabe? She is fantastic. And uh, this is uh, exactly true. Those of us uh, who have uh, the fortune to be her colleague, or uh, our students uh, know the many ways in which uh, M.M. Uh, is uh, really fantastic. And uh, I will now just uh, try to highlight a few things uh, from her uh, very impressive uh, CV. She was educated in Cambridge, Newman College, and uh, her first job uh, was also in Cambridge. She then moved to King's College London in 1990s as a lecturer in ancient philosophy and was then rapidly promoted to professor of ancient philosophy. During her time at King's, she has served the profession, the department, the college in many, many different ways. I will just mention that she was head of department, very heavy job, <laughs> from 1998 to 2003. And during her tenure, the department was given a top marks in all the exercises we are familiar with. So five star RAE and 24 out of 24 in what was called the QAA. So very brilliant leadership there, very difficult uh, to follow. She was uh, the president uh, of the British Philosophical Association uh, from 2009 to 2012. She has been uh, uh, leading uh, as one of the members uh, of the British Philosophical Association Committee for Women in the Profession. Of the many awards of which, of which she has been a recipient, I will mention only a few. Uh, she was awarded the Wellcome Trust Major Research Grant with other co-applicants for a really groundbreaking project in philosophy and medicine, which then led to the endowment of the Sowerby Chair. In 2005-2008, she was awarded the Leverium Trust a Major Research Fellowship. And then in 1997, a British Academy Leverium Trust a Senior Research Fellowship for work on Plato. But this is just the past. And Emma might be retiring from KCL, but she is very far from retiring from philosophy and from scholarship. Indeed, uh, what lies ahead uh, is uh, equally impressive. She has been uh, invited uh, to be the Sather Professor at Berkeley. She will be the first woman, in fact, uh, to give uh, the Sather Lectures, uh, which are the most uh, prestigious lectures uh, in uh, ancient philosophy. And uh, I had uh, the pleasure to read uh, the letter of invitation. And here I will just uh, quote a little bit from that, that was in a recognition of her groundbreaking and influential work in the interpretation of Plato. Not only that, in spring 2015, next year, 
She will take up a senior research fellowship at Princeton University. And uh, last but not least, uh, she has just been uh, invited uh, to become the next uh, president uh, of the MIND uh, Association. Of uh, many publications, I will uh, just mention a few, otherwise I will use all the time. We have booked for this room. Um, she is uh, the um, editor of studies in the Dialogues of Plato for Cambridge University Press, this very prestigious series. She is on the editorial board of uh, many of the top journals in the profession. Her books are very well known, Plato on Punishment, University of California Press, Plato's Individuals, Princeton University Press, Plato and his predecessor, Cambridge University Press, and now, very soon, we will have platonic conversations for Oxford University Press, collecting 15 of MMs. Essays. And she's also preparing a number of other books, including one for Oxford University Press on self knowledge in Plato, Aristotle, and the Stoa. So there is no doubt that MM is one of the most eminent people in the profession. I would like just to add that as a colleague, she has been the soul of the department for many, many years. It would be very strange not to have her in that very core place, but she will remain with us as an emerita, and so we, we are hoping to see a lot still of her. But she has certainly been crucial in establishing the ethos which is distinctive of the department. I must also add that as a senior woman in the profession, she has been absolutely inspirational for women philosophers, both colleagues and students. Now, I will conclude this brief introduction with the words of another great woman who was here at King's, that is Susan Stebbing. And just before the Second World War, Susan Stebbing published a book, Thinking to Some Purpose, and I will just quote from that book. There is an urgent need today for the citizens of a democracy to think well. It is not enough to have freedom of the press and parliamentary institutions. Our difficulties are due partly to our own stupidity, partly to the exploitation of that stupidity, and partly to our own prejudice. Now, MM has shown to us again and again that philosophy has a key role in educating people to think well. That is in a rigorous and morally courageous way. MM is someone who leads by example in standing up again and again for philosophy and its uh, key values. Amen. Rosa. Thank you all. I, I just uh, thank you all for coming, everybody, my family, my wonderful daughters. 
my wonderful extended family of Martin and all my dear friends, thank you so much for being here. Some of you have come from very long, very far away. Thank you, Tad, has come all the way from Cornell. I've just realized I forgot the handout. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to get it at the end. It's the footnotes. It's supposed to make you see that I'm actually a scholar deep down. <laughs> Sorry. It's in that box. <laughs> It is college policy that we do not say anything that might violate the college brand if we speak in the college's name. So I hereby make a disclaimer. What I am about to say are my own views, not the views of the college. Alas. <laughs> We are in trouble. Our educational system and our universities a long way up the creek. In trying to craft a paddle, I start, as always, with Plato and a debate that his Socrates began, a debate about the nature, the value, and the institutionalization of learning. For Socrates shows us, I believe, the heart of what the self-serving higher education policies of successive governments have sought to destroy, perhaps in ignorance of what they're doing, perhaps in the grip of a pernicious ideology. Socrates goes about his business in the street, in the gym, on his way to court. He meets his fellow citizens. He asks them what they're doing and what they think about it. He's eager to learn because, he says, he himself is ignorant. He hopes that his interlocutor will teach him. But often both of them end up completely flummoxed. No one seems to know anything much. Some are worried, some are furious, some couldn't care less. Socrates keeps on going, more questions, more occasions, but the pattern is general. It's sometimes hard to see how this kind of thing could ever be a model for much, apart from a kind of dismal skepticism. Hard to see, therefore, why on earth, apart from long obstinacy, I would go back to Socrates now for my valedictory words. Worse still, the character I'm talking about is a fiction of Plato's, a construct who enlivens the dialogues and often infuriates Plato's readers, my husband included. <laughs> This character claims to perform not only a good for his friends, but a great service to the state, the gadfly of the Athenians, the one true politician. He confers then a public good, the good of allowing the Athenians to understand just how much they don't know, to develop critical reflection of what they think and do, and to make dissent possible and politically functional. The barbarians were at the gates then. For this, the historical Socrates was executed by poison in 399 BC. As we defend ourselves against the barbarians now, we might think why Socrates thinks these conversations matter so much, so much as to provoke the ultimate reply from the state. You may wonder too, how close we are now to allowing to be silenced. Those who, like Socrates, seek to follow the argument where it leads. Plato's Socrates shows us not how to teach, for Socrates never claims to do that, but how to learn. He shows us what is of deep value in learning, not so much in learning a skill or in acquiring a body of knowledge, but in learning what it is to engage in an inquiry to pursue it with clarity and integrity, and to find the value of understanding as we go. For Plato, learning is loaded with value, intellectual and moral and political. And this, I say, is right, important, and desperately fragile. Socratic co conversations have complex conditions which illuminate their philosophical purpose and they matter more than ever right now. Inquiry and learning thus understood are threatened 
in the present crisis of our intellectual institutions. Plato may help us to see just what we have to lose. Socratic conversations work by question and answer, and the questions are driven by puzzlement. At first, Socrates asks, what is courage or what is justice? But he can't answer those questions. Then he worries about how we are to ask and to answer the questions, and then about why it matters. As philosophers say, the conversations are both first order and higher order. And those differences of order, of the level of the question, are reflected in Plato's dialogues, in conversations within conversations, in interruptions offset against dramatic outbursts and sulky silences, declarations of friendship and protestations of goodwill and unconvincing exits. Everything said comes under scrutiny somehow, and the conditions of scrutiny are themselves questioned over and over, so that even when no answers are forthcoming, the questions provoke thought, critical reflection, and a better grasp of what is involved in, ans in asking the question in the first place. But this all arises because the first question is asked and the answer fails. The puzzles that ensue drive it all forward, and those puzzles are both a problem for the argument and an attitude of the people engaged in it. Dialogue is between people. That Socratic inquiry is joint is no mere formality. On the contrary, Socrates calls attention not only to his own attitudes towards his interlocutor, but also to the interlocutor's attitudes to him. Often those attitudes come seriously unstuck in the course of the discussion. But the dramatic explosions of anger and frustration on the parts of Socrates' companions underline the background conditions of goodwill between the interlocutors. Socrates, of course, keeps his temper and his cool infuriatingly throughout. And Plato's readers often mistakenly think that Socrates' attitudes to his companions are somehow or other insincere. On the contrary, Socrates' portrayed attitudes illustrate an important feature of these conversations, that in being joint, they are collaborative, conditioned by positive attitudes on the parts of the participants. They fail when the interlocutor fails to observe that condition, and those failures emphasize the point. These encounters, therefore, are based on deep personal engagements, not merely abstract arguments. It's a consequence of this that they are never value-free. But this is not, as is often supposed, because Plato represents for us the good guys and the bad guys, as it were, good and bad already. On the contrary, the situating of the conversations in personal dialogue is the source of their psychological and ethical content. It emphasizes by means of the dialogue form that this psychological and ethical content is not incidental to inquiry, but essential to it. This is not the dialogue's failure, but their success, and it persists in various different and complex ways throughout Plato's work. Plato's Socrates in conversation asks his friends what they think, and he doesn't tell them what to think. But the interlocutor regularly fails to come up with an answer that satisfies as an answer. Often the discussion then runs into the ground or changes direction or restarts at some other order. But even then, four significant things are happening. First, each person somehow comes to reflect on their own point of view, whether that's a positive thesis or an objection. Each comes to some explicit articulation of what they do indeed think, and en route to some sense of what it means to articulate their views or their objections. Second, as the joint enterprise proceeds, each comes to understand the view from the standpoint of the other. This process has, again, a crucially second-order feature. They, they cannot say what piety is or courage but they do make progress in seeing how to answer such question, questions, what the conditions for an answer would be. In so doing, each comes to occupy a different stance from where they began. 
They think not only about the question, but about thinking about the question. And they do that in ways that are responsive to the fact that their partner has a different view. This, I suggest, rings true. Inquiry should be not dispassionate, but attentive to the differences of perspective of different parties. It should have a sense of what is involved in taking a stance, in having a view, in seeing through the eyes of another as well as oneself. Notice third what then happens in the course of the discussion. Conversation with Socrates is slow and fraught, but it is still a process, something that happens step by step. It is certainly reflective, but that reflection is predicated on both its psychological content, the responsiveness to the question, the drive to answer, the anxiety at inconsistency, and its ethical content. It engages fully with the other person and in ways that privilege open and honest discussion. This fourth is a con consequence of there being conversations. Each interlocutor responds to the other, either by answering questions or asking them, and this responsiveness is an acute attention to what the other says or asks. Socrates over and over again listens to what his interlocutor has to say, and he hopes that his interlocutor will listen to his questions too. This attitude of listening is often read in the tones of sarcasm and glossed as Socratic irony, but that's not quite right. Socratic irony, rather, is an attitude of non-dogmatism, and non-dogmatism is one of the ways in which listening best takes place. To listen, you must be open to what the other says. So to listen, you must not just be the representative of or the mouthpiece of an opposed view, even when your task is also to offer criticism of what the other says. This acute attention is difficult to acquire. Many of Socrates' interlocutors fail, but to the, ultimate, to the ultimate success of these exchanges, attention is essential. Without it, they disintegrate, end in bad temper and recrimination, or even in the hemlock. The jointness of this talk, that is to say, involves the responsiveness of the two to each other. They don't just talk in turn, they talk together, and that requires that they listen as well as speak. This openness of attitude figures as accountability. What it is to ask and answer questions is to be accountable for the answers or for the questions and thence for the conduct of the conversation as a whole. These attitudes are therefore not merely some dramatized version of the idea that arguments should be value-free or abstract. On the contrary, Socratic argument is never value-free because it is enmeshed in the examination of a life. Equally, Socratic conversations are not merely governed by good manners. Socrates is always civil, but, it, but that is because his civility represents his commitment to listening. In attending, he doesn't merely wait the appropriate amount of time or observe accustomed limits to his own speaking, or keep his eyes fixed on his interlocutor because he's supposed to do so, he eschews long speeches, that is to say up to a point, because long speeches fail in responsiveness to the other person. So the deep reasons for conversational good behavior run far deeper than commitment to conventional manners, for they are the essence of joint inquiry, attitudes that are hard learned and hard won in the course of thousands of conversations of this kind. Listening, therefore, has moral content, for it acknowledges that the other point of view may indeed have something to say. It requires respect and attention for the other point of view, modesty for one's own, care for the ways the different views interact, truthfulness about one, what one says, and honesty, the honesty to change one's mind or to engage to change someone else's. For Socrates, then, the process of inquiry is not merely the development of a disposition or a skill or a capacity. Rather, it is connected to virtue, 
the virtue that joint conversation both fosters and develops and demands. And as is the way with virtue, it is learned as we practice it. As a virtue, it is hard won, but once won, it may come a second nature. Socrates is the first to make what I think is the right connection between virtue and understanding or knowledge. But this is Plato's Socrates. Are you going to, Plato, well, hang on a minute, he's the bloke with forms and all that junk. Right? These conversations are not just about listening, they're about learning and about inquiry on the way to knowledge of the truth, to understanding of reality. Plato's Socrates is no woolly relativist. In the Republic, for example, Socrates insists on the connections between this slow process of inquiry by question and answer and the development of our intellectual vision, of our ability to see the truth and, crucially, to understand it. Understanding for Plato is indexed to learning and inquiry, not to winning or to acquiring intellectual stuff. The growth of understanding is the part of the intellectual work that talking together does. And this kind of discursive approach Plato takes to be necessary for proper inquiry, even if the dialogue takes place within a, within a single person's soul. Without inquiry and without developing epistemic virtue, the objects of knowledge are inaccessible to us. Plato invites us to, to think about learning and understanding as seeing or coming to see. When we see in the ordinary sense, what we see are particular things, and if we improve our seeing, we see them better. But when we understand better, what we do in any particular situation is to judge better. This is not merely a matter of seeing different things or judging different things, as some versions of Platonism insist, Rather, it is a developed capacity to see things better, a capacity of good judgment. That capacity on this view is the result of long and arduous practice and reflection. Its goodness is a consequence of that. No mere happenstance, no whim or subjective fancy, but a well-established, well-founded capacity to get the things in the domain of our vision right in all the various senses of that word. In telling us about how we learn, Plato reiterates how learning transforms the person who learns and confirms, to the moral context in which this is done. For Plato, the subject who seeks to know matters as much as the object she seeks, she seeks to understand. And if conversation is the ideal way of inquiry, then the virtues that are acquired are not merely intellectual virtues, but moral ones as well. I think Aristotle was wrong about that. For then, I just had to say that. <laughs> Can't let him get away with it. Right, so they're moral virtues, for then each party matters as much as the other. Because conversation, talking together, is at the heart of all of this, the virtues of the intellect and the virtues of moral character come together in the same process of coming to understand. Coming to understand is thus a good in itself. Think about the moments when we see something, when we suddenly find clarity and depth in our thinking, when we're able to grasp the view of another and understand it, to compare it to our own and understand that too. It would be daft to suppose that we need then to show what understanding is for, Understanding epistemic virtue is just worth having on its own. And if understanding is a collaborative matter, we may agree that it's good for both parties. It's good for me to be understood and good for you to understand and vice versa. If further learning is practiced in public, it is a public good. Thought, reflection, dissent, and understanding are goods in themselves for the polity. That is what the Athenians denied when they used the hemlock. And is what, it is what we are, are at risk of losing altogether. 
It has long been commonplace that teaching is best done by the Socratic method, especially in higher education. Socrates, of course, denies that he teaches, and he denies that there are any teachers of understanding of this kind. But something is right about this thought. For at the core of the conception of the university is the thought that we learn by sharing in a common discourse, by talking together, by learning together how to see the truth. This is central to what we do, irrespective of our subject, whether it be philosophy or physics, music or mathematics. We learn how to think, as well as deploying our thought on the specific issues of one subject or another. And we go on doing this over our long intellectual lives. Socrates' intu intuitions tell us the truth. Learning is something that we do with care and rigor, slowly and circuitously, with integrity and honesty and, above all, together. These features of learning are not incidental to it, but essential. None of us is here, then, to teach, but to be learners together. It's this feature of the academic community which matters so much. The, the acquisition of information can be done by all sorts of means, in a laboratory or a library, at a lecture or on the internet. But acquiring information is, is no good at all without the wisdom and the understanding to grapple with it and to grapple with ourselves. No matter how many things we know, it will make no difference if our understanding fails. If all of that is right, then the central activity of a university should be exactly this kind of learning together. Joint activities between student and staff, between staff and staff and student and student, no matter how hard or demanding that may be. It makes no difference whether we're philosophers or physicists, students of literature or of the, or of the cell. All of us must start with developing the means to understand what it is we do to develop the hard virtues that lie at the foundation of the community of thought. For here we are together confronting questions which may themselves be intractable, but whose consideration helps us to advance our understanding of the nature of thought, of the nature of nature, and the nature of culture, of the nature of ourselves. Further, we do indeed think, I put to you, that the understanding we seek is a matter of both moral and intellectual virtue. Let me give you a local example. In 2010, as many of you may remember, this department was threatened with targeted redundancy and the threat that we would have to compete with each other for our jobs, hardly a Socratic process. In the midst of the furore that followed, one event shone out. A group of our graduate students, many of whom I see here tonight, I would like to celebrate them now. I'm not going to give their full names because I'm frightened of what might happen as a consequence. But Lucy, Peter, Peter, Luke, Rory, Alex, Jen, Calbiera, Maya, thank you. This group spent several weeks discussing the so-called consultation document that had been put to us and debating it with the college. I note en passant that another such document is on its evil rounds in the health, in the health sciences at the moment. Nobody seems to learn these lessons. Our students produced a powerful analysis of the document, focusing on both the poor argumentation and on the wrong that poor argumentation supported. This made, I believe, a considerable impact on the consultation process itself, which was withdrawn. But recall how we thought about what those students did. We were unbelievably proud of them. We admired them, I think, and what they did, because it displayed the virtues I've been describing. It wasn't that they used their analytic skills in the service of some moral end, not that for them the intellect, intellectual capacity was useful. Rather, they engaged with what they saw as a moral disgrace directly, and in ways that were both morally and intellectually admirable, with courage, 
integrity and respect. And those ways were, I think, in this case, indissoluble. Our own attitudes to events such as this, I put to you, reinforce the thought that thinking is as Plato's Socrates suggested it to be. But that kind of thinking is fragile, and not only because we are financially squozen. Think about where it may go wrong. I start again thinking about philosophy and how it works, but what I say is generalizable, I believe, for other academic disciplines, as much for the science as the humanities, all of which demand the kind of critical reflectiveness that Socrates practices, and all of which, if I am right, need to be governed by both intellectual and moral norms. Academic work, and in particular, perhaps, philosophy, sometimes seems otherwise, as a competition to make sure one's own point of view, one's theory, one's pet project wins, and devil take the hindmost. A competitor cannot afford to listen, to hear any other view than her own. She cannot engage in joint inquiry, since that is predicated on listening and on taking a view outside her own. Even if it happens that what she says is true, she cannot, in failing to see those other points of view, come to understand how thinking is configured or explained. She is stuck, you might think, in the first order. That competitive approach is an easy vice, and its collaborative counterpart is fragile. So competition often wins. It must not do so. For competition makes what we do shallow and insincere. Competition isolates us and traduces our humanity. Competition damages thought and openness and modesty and civility. We should resist competition for our own sakes, of course, but also for the sakes of our institutions. Competition feeds the rampant desire for power. It feeds it and makes it insatiable at our expense and at the expense of our students. Our institutions have sold their souls to the market and the league table and the mission group and all those wretched acronyms to which I shall return. I refuse to sell my soul too. Socrates prefers death to giving up philosophy. And he insists that his kind of inquiry is not a private good, but a public good. Follow the argument where he leads, where, sorry, follow the argument where it leads, says Socrates. What does that involve? Socratic argument does not merely address the question at hand, but also the conditions for answering it. So Socratic argument is unlimited in scope. It deals with the conditions of thought as much as the content of the thoughts themselves. And those conditions include not only the cognitive conditions of what is said, but the entire context of the discussion. That was Socrates' final point. He will follow the argument where it leads, even to death. For in understanding how to think, we had better not think that there are some things we cannot consider, places where we must not go, discussions that are barred to us. So following the argument where it leads requires that we can expose any thought at all to scrutiny. Of course, that had better not mean that everything is up for grabs at once. This kind of intellectual openness doesn't mean that we start an argument with no assumptions, nor that we call everything into question all at the same time. But it does mean that anything is up for grabs. There is nothing that we cannot inspect or discuss or ask or assess or criticize or condemn in the course of the argument. Now notice the scope of follow the argument where it leads. For it is, in fact, a fundamental principle of academic freedom. It suggests that thought does not have, should not have, constraints or boundaries or no-go areas, whether those no-go areas are intellectual or moral or political or institutional. 
Indeed, it's a principle which chimes with, even if it is stronger than, the Haldane principle, a much disputed claim about the nature and role of university funding. Follow the argument where it leads matters deeply because it points to how the ways of inquiry that Socrates advocates are not such as to be restricted by external pressures or constraints. But the increasingly prescriptive modes of contemporary university management are deeply inimical to these central ways of thought, and in my recent experience, more and more overtly so. University management finds some discussion uncomfortable or even dangerous. Questions about internal management, critique of the nature of the institution or the nature of the sector. Sometimes discussion of these matters are represented as failure to match the university's brand or as undermining the university's policies or as somehow or other gross misconduct, the modern equivalent of the indictment against Socrates. This is wrong on principle. Even if we were to set aside the grotesquerie of a university's brand, academic thought and critical reflection must not be con constrained or, nor prevented from discussing and scrutinizing not only the conditions of argument, but its context. And that context includes its institutionalization. Brands must be trumped by freedom of inquiry. Indeed, Socratic modes of thought, I say, should be pervasive throughout the institution. Academic institutions should not be managed containers for open thinking, hermetically sealed from the outside, nor ghettoized boxes in which we may experience what it is to talk together, but forswear it when we walk in the street. On the contrary, if I'm right in insisting that this kind of developed understanding is an obvious public good, then its restriction is a public evil. In inquiry, we talk together. In our institutions, we should talk together too. The demands of moral and intellectual virtue, I conclude, should be felt throughout the university system. And it was for this that Socrates chose death over giving up talking together with the Athenians. Talking together requires that both parties attend to each other, that each listen as well as speak. What is involved in that kind of listening? On the view I've outlined, listening is ethically loaded. It requires a kind of attentiveness to the other point of view, which is easy to fake and easier still to neglect. It's also hard to diagnose. Someone may have all the appearance of listening. They may even be able to repeat what you said and yet not listen at all. Institutional deafness is often betrayed by the use and abuse of language. That lurks, of course, in the vacuous rhetoric of management. But it can be pinpointed. Remember that? consultation document. In the document, the word consultation, I have it on my text in scare quotes, because philosophers, when they're talking about words, do that, of course. But it was quite scary, so it needs to be quoted. Consultation meant the legal requirement of warning of impending redundancy. And in it, consultation in the vernacular sense was closed. When the document was defeated, its proposers claimed that it was open after all. It was a consultation document. And those who had inflicted pain and humiliation on so many of us saved face and never apologized. After all, they were only consulting. The moral disgrace was papered over by slate of word. Equivocation is not merely a logical danger. It is an ethical one, the mark of a moral tin ear. Or think about metaphor. Imagine that you want to enlarge the scope of your discussion to include several people 
in full cognizance of their significance and their ethical standing. When you do that, do not cascade the message to your recipients. When some instruction is cascaded to me, as it frequently is, I am offended not only by the rebarbative grammar. If cascade is a verb, it is intransitive. <laughs> but by its imperative and disrespectful mode. Socrates points to how respect is fundamental to open intellectual and moral exchange. The abuse of language damages respect and shows up where it has been withheld. Or think about private languages. Remember, as I bitterly do and as Rosa mentioned, the days when we had the Quality Assurance Agency. And the ri I see Joe over there. The rise of the language of Kwahili. Do you remember that was what it was called when we were heads of department all through us together? Recall what those private languages did and still do. They make anodyne what is pernicious. The ref has become a proper word. But is it still disgraceful? Keats is an online learning system at which John Keats, who's on the front of the college, whose little boy stood in his shoes and he wondered, is turning in his grave. These private languages, these smart acronyms and logos, logos, <laughs> logos, I don't think I've ever said that out loud before, I'm glad to say. <laughs> and brands camouflage harm and exclude from consultation those who are not in the know. They protect from criticism the vacuity of the measures. They load us with guilt, which I still feel, that we ever became experts in this debased talk. Who remembers, many of us un unfortunately in this room may do, the distinction between aims and objectives. <laughs> Cast in terms that could somehow or other tick the boxes or fail. The difference between an aim and an objective, if I remember rightly, was that an objective could be verified. An aim is so vague that it doesn't matter. <laughs> and it only worked if you knew the private language. Obscurantism is a danger to scholarship, and it is a danger to scholars too. It is a weapon used to shore up the shakiness of these systems against proper critical reflection, and we have been too busy, too frightened, too insouciant to call it out. But we have lost more than we know. When the institution doesn't listen, we are talking to ourselves. Return once more to the moral structure of the Socratic conversation. This involved, I argued, each interlocutor hearing the other, taking responsibility for where the conversation might go and being accountable for what they said. It is to this accountability that we should hold those who attempt to curtail our academic freedom. In the present structure of the universities, that accountability has vanished in part because we have failed to insist upon it, and in part because we have been taken over by alien institutions ill-fitted to the proper development of understanding and in which accountability has comprehensively failed. Here is why. In the wake of Deering and Lambert, the structures of university governance have been changed. The pressure then was twofold. First, to see universities as mass education or, uh, organizations modeled on business. The second, to suppose that good judgment for such cases is to be provided not by those who are centrally involved, but precisely by those who are not. It's a good idea. <laughs> this had two effects on universities around the country. College councils were reconstituted, composed largely of lay advisors and senates or academic boards were reduced to a merely advisory role. What could underpin the thought 
that a lay council would be appropriate for a university. The analogue might have been a jury presented with the evidence for a collective of a, uh, sorry, presented with the evidence. A collective of opinions is likely to come up with a sensible adjudication of matters of fact, uncontaminated by knowing too much law. The epistemic principle here is a democratic one, that a plurality of points of view will produce a good judgment. Likewise, on this view, a group of lay advisors would be best placed to make judgments about university policy uncontaminated by knowing too much about what's going on, and uncontaminated, so it is supposed, by having values at stake which would render their judgments less objective. Can I just remark that we are at fault here. The contrast between fact and value, between objective and subjective, between absolute and relative, are contrasts that philosophical Pandoras let out of the box without knowing what was going to become of them and us as a consequence. The analogy between, between juries and college councils is, of course, absurd. However individual and personal may be the conversations on which I, which I have insisted should lie at the heart of academic life, they do not occur at random or without deep experience and thought about the very conduct of the, of the conversations themselves. On the contrary, the learning that occurs in a university, however open-ended, is profoundly informed by whatever went on before and around. These engagements are not isolated, nor are they value-free. It doesn't follow from this that their value is merely subjective, nor, worse still, that it can be made objective only by the application of some balmy algorithm which might turn expert judgments into spurious numbers. It is folly to commit to the navigation of universities to people who have precisely none of the experience in question. Folly and an inevitable road towards competition and spurious markets. Accountability has been twisted beyond recognition so that experts are here made accountable to lay people or to managers whose managerial expertise, supposing there to be such a thing, should not be conflated with their being in a position to make academic judgments. From the point of view of the academics, we are talking to ourselves. From the point of view of managers, we already say too much. What is at stake here? I put to you that it is our intellectual virtues, through and through, and the public good which they constitute. Academics should not be accounting to councils and managers. On the contrary, accounting, as Socrates makes clear, should be made to those who are in a position to make good judgments about the academic enterprise, the academics themselves. This is the core of the issue, and it needs to be understood not only by government, but also by our own institutions, the institutions which shamefully seek to restrict what we say. Our university system is going badly wrong, but it's too easy to say, as you may take me to have been saying, that this has only happened because the balance of power has changed and because management has taken to itself the control of academic decision. Socrates again, if we talk together, then each of us is accountable and each of us is responsible for what happens next and that means us. The system itself has come out like this because we have allowed it to do so we have allowed competition to flourish. We haven't laughed loudly enough at the suggestion on every university's website that league tables mean something. We have not protested enough that learning is not a product or a brand. We have gone along with the, with the urge to win out above our colleagues in other institutions. We have competed, haven't we, for grants, for ratings, for students, for resources, and for prestige. We've done that even where we knew that the resources and the prestige are limited. 
and where we could recognize, had we dared to do so, that our winning means someone else loses, and that those, often, those losses often do damage where damage is least deserved to the weak and the dispossessed. If one university flourishes on the present arrangements, another fails to thrive. And the students who may be able only to go to the latter will become the field casualties. If one university wins, another loses, and those who need it are left on the outside. It is essential, I claim, to the activity of universities that its participants talk together with the full intellectual and moral and political sense of what that means. This central activity is no respecter of persons. Just as Socrates would talk to anyone as they went to market on their way to buy a cabbage, so these engagements are not the preserve of some elite already demarcated by standing or achievement or importance or role. However nervous Plato may have been of the decisions and the emotions of large groups of people acting en masse, his Socrates represents the thought that anyone can learn to talk like this, regardless of status or gender or race. I just, a footnote, I would like to thank Tom Hulley in the department, who found a picture for the poster of Socrates with two women. <laughs> Brilliant. The root and branch rethinking of the university system in this country, a rethinking that is long overdue, and which will surely be precipitated by the disasters of the current funding regime. This rethinking should attend from the very start to the demands of equality, equality which is fundamental to the flourishing of society as a whole. But we are a long way from this rethinking at present. Marketized ac academic life is like football. The gallop up the league tables is incompatible with processes of learning that are slow, open, unpredictable, whether they're conducted with students or colleagues, whether what we're talking about here is what's called teaching or what's called research. Marketization is fundamentally unequal, elitist, damaging to the weak. Socrates could speak to all comers and so should we. In our present world, we do not, more shockingly, we are not allowed to do so. The brand silences us again. As Thomas Doherty has acutely pointed out, widening participation is merely a sop to Cerberus, a public relations exercise that covers up the fact that if you're in the Premier League, you never play with teams from that conference, let alone with the kids who are playing football in the street. Having a mascot from the street does not equality make when the entire structure is directed towards the inequality of competition to the struggle for power among those who should but do not care for the deep values of moral and intellectual virtue, who traduce both the public good by greed and the primacy of honest truth by censoring whatever does not accord with a ridiculous brand. And we have not brought them to book. Learning cannot be put up for sale like this, and we are responsible for saying so loud and clear. Socrates, I hope, may show us why. I came to this department in 1990. It was a revelation to me then that philosophy could be done in this collaborative Socratic mode. It was led at that time by the incomparable Mark Sainsbury, who I'm glad is here. Ever since then, perhaps most of all in the last few years, as the crisis of the universities deepens, and for us from the debacle of 2010, this department has stood for doing what is right, not merely what is expedient or pragmatic or cheap at the expense of persons, a series of requirements that change in their content by the month, from firing to hiring to rehiring to buying back or not. The principal once asked me whether we are happy department. And the president asked me the same question. My reply is that we flourish and together. It has been my extraordinary privilege 
and joy to have been a part of that. To feel, however it may affect me personally, that none of my dear friends and colleagues stand down for the defence of what we do and how we should do it. I would like to express, therefore, my utter and profound gratitude to my departmental colleagues, present and past, and to all my students, some of whom became my colleagues and many of whom are here tonight, who gave me the gift of watching them flourish and stand up in their turn. And in standing down myself, I leave them with an injunction. It is part of what we do that we take responsibility for how it is done, bear the responsibility well. <laughs>